My name is David Neal. I go by Reverend Geek on the Twitters. Uh, I would say you can trust me because I have a beard, but I, I had um, breakfast this morning, and the guy at the table says, I don't trust anybody that says you can trust me. So uh, I do have a beard, and I, I ride motorcycles, and I eat a lot of bacon and drink a lot of caffeine, so you be the judge. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. So what we're talking about here, thanks, thanks everybody for coming to my talk. I'm super excited that uh, so many people decided to be here and, the, and listen to me go on about stuff. But uh, I'm going to talk about Electron. I'm going to talk about why we even want to consider building desktop apps in this uh, mobile first, web first world that we live in today. Uh, give you a quick crash course on how to get started with Electron and some tips and stuff that I've learned along the way of building some apps myself. So, to start off, I want to give you a little bit of story about how I got started uh, with, with this whole process. So, I am a uh, .NET developer for, for a long, long time. I was at the Microsoft PDC in 2000 when .NET was announced. Uh, they gave everybody this little book called Presenting C Sharp. I went, being the nerd that I am, I went to the hotel and I read the entire book that night and I thought, wow, this is awesome stuff. I'm going to do C Sharp from now on. And then two years later, I finally got to do it. Um, that was how things rolled back then. Um, so when the time came that I needed to create some desktop tools uh, for some of our customers, I thought, well, our, web, our mobile developers, our mobile team is having really great success building cross-platform apps with Xamarin. And Xamarin has this Xamarin Mac tool, which supposedly I can build desktop apps with, with, uh, with that for the Mac. And I thought, well, I'll use my mad.net skills to build some, some desktop apps. And the pros I found was, yes, you can, through portable class libraries, you can have like a shared code base of, you know, for your application. So you can have the core of your application portable between the two uh, operating systems, or e and even Linux. Uh, but that's kind of where the benefits ended. Xamarin Mac doesn't get the same amount of love as iOS and Android. You know, it's kind of like this, this other, you know, redheaded stepchild of the Xamarin tools. And native UI is extremely hard. Um, I'm a web developer. I've been doing web for a long, long time. And for me, doing WinForms or WPF is like a real struggle. And I can't, and I know even less about Xcode UI. So doing UI for these desktop apps, you still have to do, I've got to build the UI and, and for Windows, I've got to build the UI for the Mac, and on Linux, God help you. <laughs> uh, you got to do some kind of GTK stuff and all, you know, it's, it's, it's not even documented. So good luck. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, and deployment is really hard because, you know, they kind of, you know, the ecosystem around Windows is fine, but if you want to deploy your, your desktop apps to, to Mac or Linux, then you got to have mono or you got to have some kind of static builds or something like that and deploy, you know, compiling mono on the Mac, you can fry an egg on your, on your laptop it's, and it takes forever. So I knew that it was going to be a real, real challenge to try to get deployment done. and, and um, at the time that I was doing this, it was before Xamarin was required, acquired by Microsoft, and licensing was a deal breaker. It was like a thousand bucks a year for the Xamarin Mac uh, tools, and that, you know, I couldn't really justify this. It's not an app I'm going to be selling to anybody. Uh, it's just some tools that I needed to create. So this is how I ended up on this whole journey with the, with the going the, uh, the .NET way. So, I decided I'd hear, heard about this thing called Electron, and I thought I'd give it a shot. The pros I found are it is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and um, you know those are you know technologies that I'm really comfortable with. And it's Electron is built on Node.js and Chrome. The cool thing is it's a specific version of Node.js and Chrome, so you're you're working with the latest version of Node the latest version of Chrome, and those things are what you're, you're targeting when you're, when you're building your application. And there are no deployment dependencies. So 
when you, bun when you create your application, Node.js and Chrome are bundled into that application and it's a standalone app. So the person who is using your, your application doesn't already have to have Node installed and they don't even have to have Chrome installed. Or if they've got some you know, older version of Chrome or some older or you know, a different version of Chrome, that doesn't matter because it's all self-contained in this application. And so my experience with Electron was really, really awesome. And one thing to note is that when you're using Electron, the, uh, the latest version of Node and the latest version of Chrome, you're, you're building against the latest version of, of the V8 engine. So you have like 95 plus percent of ES6 support uh, right out of the gate. So you don't have to do like Babel or anything like that to transpile your JavaScript. You can write, you know, ES6 type JavaScript, which is really awesome. Now, I would, you know, with any technology, there are some trade-offs. You know, there's some pros and the cons. And uh, Electron is not without uh, some, some trade-offs. And I would say that the con for Electron is that it's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. <laughs> so if you're not already, you know, comfortable with those, you know, building web applications, then this could be a bit of a challenge for you. It is JavaScript all the way down. Um, and we all like to bash on JavaScript, but it's cool stuff. So some history about uh, Electron. We've got, it was created by GitHub for the Atom editor. And uh, it was norm formerly called the Atom Shell, and to avoid confusion and, and you know, make sure that people didn't think that you know, the only thing you could do with it was build an editor, they renamed it to Electron. And it's been around since about 2013. Uh, 1.0 release was earlier this year. Uh, I haven't checked recently, but what they've been doing is that ever since 1.0, they've been following the, uh, the whole Chrome and Node V8 stuff really, really closely. So the latest versions of, of Electron are usually about a week to two weeks behind the stable releases of, of Node and, uh, and Chromium. Some of the features of Electron include uh, rapid development, uh, being able to do themes. So since it is CSS, you can easily support different themes in your application. So if you want to have a light or dark theme, or if you want to have customizable themes for your app, or even like make it really easy to rebrand your application. So if you got, you know, one, you know, you've, you've created a, an application for this particular client, you can easily take those assets and, you know, change out the CSS and some images and, and create the same application somewhere else or, uh, or target some vertical markets, that kind of thing. It makes it really easy. Chances are if you have a web application, there's, there's a lot of JavaScript code and CSS and, and other things that you could probably leverage into an Electron app. Um, as a like first out of the gate approach, like a proof of concept, you might even just point your Electron application at your existing web app. That you can do that uh, to, to maybe get started. Electron has solved a lot of problems for you already, including deployment and silent updates. So if you've used Atom or some other application that's that's built on Electron, you may see periodically. If you how many here use Visual Studio Code? Yeah, so you've seen periodically the little notification that says, you know, a new version is available. Do you want to restart and, and do that now? That's kind of out of the box with, with Electron. You can provide that same kind of experience with your Electron apps. There are some tooling and some notifications that are built into it that you can, you know, point it to a, a, a server where you, you know, basically put your deployments and it can pull down the latest one automatically and you know, raise events and so forth. And they've added a bunch of APIs to uh, Node.js and Chrome so that you have native, uh, you know, some native UI type things. So things like file open and save, uh, printer dialogues, uh, menus, system notifications, all these things that you would expect from you know, a native application on each operating system. So when you're running, when you're running uh, this application on Mac, you're getting all the you know, Mac standard menus and icons and notifications, the dialog boxes, all those things, and on Windows, the same kind of deal. So it makes it really easy. You, you can truly write you know, one set of code, and it's going to behave appropriately on each operating system. 
So why should we even consider uh, desktop apps? And I think there are still, you know, basically, in my opinion, there are still a class of applications that are, uh, you know, just feel like the right thing to do. Um, if you need to do offline access, maybe you've got, you're building an application that, uh, maybe in healthcare where people are going out and they're, and they're having to do a lot of data entry and stuff. So a laptop is still the, the right thing to do. You know, you don't want to do a bunch of data entry on an iPad. You know, that's, that's frustrating. Uh, but, you know, you're going out in places where we don't have, you know, access to the internet and you want to do some data entry and be able to resync when you get back. Uh, maybe there's, specific drivers, uh, devices that you want to be able to use with, as part of your application. This was uh, my reason for getting into building desktop apps is I work for a company that's, that's a SaaS product. It runs in the cloud and occasionally we need to build some custom integrations with other tools, but those other tools live in a, a client's, you know, network. And it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not okay for us to say, hey, will you open up your firewall and let us talk to your, uh, your systems from, you know, from our SaaS product? That's not going to happen. So I needed to create some utilities that could run on-premises that would communicate with their systems and then, you know, make appropriate API calls back out to our system so that it could synchronize data. And then there's uh, internal line of business apps, uh, being able to edit local files and access, local, you know, a lot of local resources. Maybe you want to monetize your application, put it in the App Store, like the Windows App Store or the Apple Mac Store. Uh, kiosk applications, there's a, there's a feature inside Electron that allows the, app, the application to run full screen where you, you know, you're, that's the only application that you can, you can interact with. Um, sometimes desktop, you know, for maybe political reasons or, you know, maybe it's just really hard to get intranet applications you know, I've worked at some organizations where it's really hard to get, you know, internet applications deployed and, and maintained and updated. There's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of frustration around those things. And maybe it's like, I need to build this tool and only two or three other people are going to use it. This is going to save us a lot of time. I'll just zip it up and hand it to them, you know, and they can run the application uh, as an Electron app a lot. And then, uh, as I said before, sometimes it just feels right that uh, a desktop app. And what I mean by that is I went, I'm not going to read through every one of these, but you can see this list and think, well, there's, there's desktop versions of these kinds of applications that, that work really well and make sense to be desktop apps. Uh, maybe you want to create a video player or, or do some games or, or whatever. Lots and lots of, of use cases. So some examples of Electron applications. We've already talked about Atom. That's what um, that's what Electron was created for in the first place. How many here use Slack? Yeah. Uh, this is what really got my attention. When I found out that the Slack desktop app was uh, basically a web app, an Electron application with some React and all that stuff, this is what, you know, like blew my mind. It's like, this is a, a Node app, a web app? Really? Uh, they did a really good job on that. And then, of course, when Visual Studio Code came out, I'm thinking, well, how did Microsoft pull that off? Because I looked at Xamarin, you know, because my, my assumption was they're using Xamarin to build this, this tool. And, uh, you know, how did they do it? And when I found out it was Electron app, I was like, wow. Uh, Node.js, Chrome, open source. It really is a, a new Microsoft. Um, Here's an example of one of those that it just feels right to be a desktop app. Wagon is a SQL editor. It, it, it allows you to manage lots of different kinds of SQL databases. And this is one of those cases where it wouldn't make sense for them to be a SaaS product. Because again, you know, DBAs might be a little uncertain about opening up their firewall and allowing other applications to come in and, and manage their databases. So you need to have something that you can run, you know, in your, in your local environment. Uh, Postman, the, an API tool, I use this all the time. It, if, you ha, if you do anything with REST APIs at all, Postman can be your, your best friend. And uh, they now have uh, Electron versions of their, uh, for Mac and Windows, 
makes it really easy to manage API calls and to be able to set up tests and, and do all kinds of things. Nihilus N1 is an interesting uh, app application. It's a, it's a mail client. It's open source. Uh, but being that it's built on Electron, they've done some things like they took um, ideas from Atom and Visual Studio Code. There's a whole package ecosystem around uh, this mail client. So you can pull in packages that have been contributed by the community. You can have different themes. You can write your own packages that are basically just HTML and JavaScript. And uh, it ma makes for a really, really customizable mail experience. You can have plugins that do like uh, trans language translations or GitHub integrations. There's tons of things you can do with, with this mail client. Another example that kind of blew my mind when I found out uh, that it was Electron is, is Speak. Speak.io is um, a video conferencing, uh, you know, window sharing uh, application. And the things that they've done, like around uh, dock, these dockable floating windows and stuff, they've done some really interesting things around the UI that look like, well, how did they pull that off? And in, Electron gives you the ability to, to, to turn off Chrome, as in the lower C Chrome, you know, like the, 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 the window handles and stuff around your applications. So they've done some really neat things. And they're taking advantage of the WebRTC components that are already in Chrome for doing like the video conferencing. So now that we've looked at some applications and some other things, I want to show you just a real quick start of how to use um, Electron, it's, it's actually really easy to get started. You will need to begin with some version of Node. It doesn't have to be the version of Node that's in Electron, but you'll have to go to nodejs.org and download uh, uh, the Node installer if you don't already have it. But given that you, you have Node installed, you go to the command line and you can type npm install Electron prebuilt. Uh, well, I'm leaving out a step. You need to have a folder for your project, right? You know, see, you're starting with, with that, that much. Um, and this is going to pull down for your operating system, whether you're on Windows or Mac or Linux, it's going to pull down the appropriate binaries and support files for uh, Electron Prebuilt or Electron. NPM, if you don't already know, is, is the uh, Node mo package manager for, for Node. It's like the NuGets or, or whatever you want to use. It's, uh, it's how you access all the modules that are out there in the repository. You'll need a couple of files uh, to get started. It, one JavaScript file and an HTML file, it doesn't matter what the names are. Uh, I typically use main.js as the starting point for my application and then some like home.html or index.html. Um, and then to give you a little bit of vocabulary on an on a, on Electron application, Electron starts its lifetime as basically a Node.js process. So that Node.js process starts, that is your main JS, it's like a bootstrap, and then from there you can launch what uh, instances of Chrome. In, in the uh, Electron vocabulary, it's called, they're called renderers. And not only can you launch, you know, like your main page for your applications, you can also launch as many instances of, of renderers as you need to. If you need support multiple windows or d at different points in your application's life cycle. Maybe you're going to show some different information in a different window. You can do that as well. That main JS is going to look a little bit like something like this. This is like the, the Hello World example. Uh, so the main JS, you're going to require in the Electron uh, package. So in, in terms of node, require is how you import other modules, it's like the imports or use, using statement. So you're going to pull that in, and then um, you're going to grab a couple of objects off of the uh, Electron uh, object, the app in the browser window, and then the app is, uh, does a lot of like application lifecycle type events. You can uh, kind of like jQuery, like ready, the ready event is like you know that the, the application's started up and you're ready to start doing your own work. So in here we can create a, a new window. This is what the instance of Chrome is gonna, uh, what we're creating is a browser window. 
And we can specify things like width and the height, but there's lots of other properties. We can do like the position, the XY position, the minimum and maximum widths and heights. We can make it uh, resizable or not, and we can set kiosk mode. There's a bunch of properties that we can set on the browser window. And we can turn that Chrome off, so if we want a, like a frameless window, uh, we can do all kinds of neat things. And then last, uh, you're going to load a, a, an HTML file into your, into your window. And in this case, I'm, you know, typically what you're going to do is you're going to package your HTML files with the application. As I said earlier, maybe as a proof of concept, you could just point this to you know, the URL for your, 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 your existing web app. On the HTML side, you can have something as, as simple as this, so the title and a body, uh, hello from Electron. And then as you're getting started with, with development, the simplest thing to do is just go to the command line where, you've, where you have your project, and you can type Electron space main or Electron, uh, or just type Electron if you've got the information in your package JSON. And what that's going to do is it's going to fire up the window, and you got you know, hello from Electron, hello world. So we've got the title becomes the title of the window and whatever's in the body becomes the body of the application. Now that's, that's pretty cool and that's, you can get started with that really easily. But here's the, here's the really awesome thing about Electron. I can add a script tag to the body uh, uh, or anywhere in the, in the HTML and I can start doing some cool things that are, that I can access the entire node uh, process from my web page. So when I, when I first looked at Electron, I just made the assumption that I'm going to have to, you know, I've got node running in the background. I've got to make some kind of fake Ajax calls from my uh, Chrome instance back to this node process. You know, that's, that was kind of my assumption, but it's, that's not correct. They're, that what they've done is they've added uh, all of node into uh, and made it accessible to your to your browser. So I can look at things like the process. I can, I can require in Node.js modules, native modules, or, or third-party modules into uh, my HTML. I can access things like the um, environment variables, like knowing where the home directory is for the, for the current user and all those kinds of different environments. Um, and as I mentioned before, I can use ES6 syntax. I don't have to do any kind of transpilation or anything, I can, I can do that directly. And um, when I run this app, you know, this version of the application, I can see what versions of things are running and I can iterate through, you know, like all the folders that are in my, my home directory. So I have full access to the file system, uh, full access to, you know, the user context of all the, you know, the things that the user can do. Um, there's no sandboxing, so there's, your application can do anything that a normal desktop application needs to do, and you can do it straight from, from your, your web app, from the HTML. Uh, another cool thing about, about this, I'll, you know, a tip that I'll give you right away, is that when you're loading up your main window, you can choose to open the dev tools. So it is Chrome, so when you do uh, open dev tools, that is the Chrome dev tools. You know, you've, as a web developer, you're probably already familiar with being able to set breakpoints and be able to inspect all your HTML and drill into to things. That's, that's uh, immediately available to you. And it look, you know, it's going to look something like this. Uh, one really cool feature, I may not be able to read this, but it's, this, it adds a tab over here called DevTron. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that gives you some additional uh, debugging tools and developer tools uh, just for Electron. Now, you may have heard this before. There are two hard problems in software development. Cache invalidation, naming things, off by one errors. <laughs> yeah, we do that a lot. Well, I submit to you that there are actually four hard problems in software development. Now, I don't know what your development workflow is like, but at my company, it's really, really important to choose the, the perfect animated GIF that goes along with how you feel about your coworkers' code, like you're, you're messaging each other in Slack. Uh, and I don't, you know, for those of you that use Slack, you know that Giphy is like the worst. No matter what you put in, it's gonna pick the worst thing that could possibly, you know, come out. And it's like notoriously bad. So, 
I created an Electron app to solve this problem. Uh, so I, I, it's called Reactor because I'm, I'm using React and, you know, it's Electron. And uh, so I'm thinking, well, I, this is a pretty good animated clip to express how I feel about my, this, this pull request that I'm viewing. But I don't think it, it, it's not quite enough. So let's see. This one might be a little bit better. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's, uh, that's how I feel about it. So I can copy. I can click a button on there to copy that, that image to my clipboard, paste that into Slack or wherever I need to go, and, uh, and, uh, and away we go. This may be the, the most important, significant application of my career. <laughs> um, if you want this, this is out on my, my GitHub repository uh, as Reactor. So there are some, some, pro, there's some modules uh, I mentioned before, some native ext modules that, that Electron provides. Um, so process is that main process. It's like your, your Node.js process. So there's some modules specifically for process. That includes app, which we you know already mentioned that it's got application lifecycle events. You can also access command line arguments, uh, be able to launch those other browsers and so forth. Uh, you can d detect you know if there's a crash in your application and other types of things. Uh, IPC is uh, interprocess communication, so to be able to communicate between your main process and the uh, the renderer process. You're going to use IPC to like, in a publish, subscribe, pub sub model, and you can do you can go either way. So I can send messages from main to my renderers. I can send messages from my renderer back to the main to do do certain things. Uh, dialog is uh, that file open and save and printer type things. Menus and menu items. Those are the system uh, you know system menus. Um, Again, you know, when you, you're using one API and it's going to look and render appropriately for each operating system. There's also Power Monitor, which is, uh, allows you to detect things like, are they, you know, is it a laptop? Is it plugged in? Is it running on battery? And also things like the, the screensaver. So if you're creating, a, a, say, a video client, you wanna, you've got some courseware you want to deploy uh, to, to some customers. You don't want the screensaver to kick in while they're watching a video. So you can turn, you can intercept those kind of events. And you can also know when uh, the, you know, they've shut the laptop lid and, and your, uh, the laptop's going into hibernation or sleep mode. So you can, you know, take appropriate action in your application as part of that event to uh, shut down services or close files or whatever you need to do. And then there's, there's trade notifications. On the renderer side, uh, you've got also got IPC. You've got this special version of IPC called Remote. This allows you to like execute code directly on the main process um, instead of having to send a message to main, have main run that job, and then let you know when it's done. This is kind of just a, a, a direct way of doing it. WebFrame is um, really useful if you want to pull in external content into your application. This acts kind of like a, an iframe. But it's also, but it's appropriately sandboxed. You can turn off the node integration. You can do some things with that frame so that you're not opening up any kind of security vulnerabilities in your application to that external content. Uh, modules that are available to both. You've got clipboards. You can uh, copy and, and pull things out of the uh, uh, clipboard. You've got a built-in crash reporter. So if your application crashes, you can post uh, debug stack trace type information to some endpoint on your system. There's a, a native image, so if you got, you can support different uh, display types like retina display on Mac and um, you know, high DPI type displays on Windows. This allows you to do like the, the, icon, the tray icons and stuff for your application. You can support different resolutions of that. There's a screen module, and this allows you to um, not only know the dimensions of the screen that you're working on, but also enumerate all the displays that are connected to your, uh, uh, to the, to the operating system. So you can, if you want to have multi-monitor support for your application, you can, you can definitely support that. You can have windows on, on different monitors. And then there's shell. So you can, 
uh, shell out to some application that's on the, on the system. You can run other types of scripts. You could even uh, uh, move files to the, to the trash or whatever. Um, and then there's the, the all important uh, system.beep. Always got to have that in your application somewhere. Some recommended tools. Um, Electron Debug is, uh, allows you, I, I ship this with all my applications. It, what that does is it, it enables the uh, Chrome Dev Tools keyboard shortcuts so that you can say, well, if somebody calls you and says, We're, you know, we've got a problem with this application, you can say, well, type Control Shift I or F12, and that pops open the, the Chrome Dev Tools, and then they freak out because they've never seen that before. They think you've, you know, taken over their computer. Um, but you can step through, you know, and look at the console and do some things, you know, as a, as a remote debugging type thing. Uh, Electron Reload is a, you know, in, during development. This allows um, basically hot, like, like the hot reloading type scenario where you can, you can have your application running and as you make changes to HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, it detects those changes and automatically refreshes your app so that you don't have to close the application and restart it which can get, you know, really old. Electron Packager uh, will take, so to be clear, um, you can take an Electron application, that Electron pre-built, along with your HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and you can bundle that together and, and hand that to someone. As, as, now, when they run it, they, you know, they, they got to run Electron and they've got to run the, ex or the executable uh, the icon is going to look like the electron icon, all those kinds of things, but it is, it's a functioning application. Uh, electron Packager will take your application and, and turn it into an executable that's more standalone. It's, you, know, you can put in some assets like change the icon of the application, change some of the uh, metadata about the application, and you know, that may be a great first step just to be able to zip that up and hand it to somebody. And then Electron Builder takes that one step further and creates an installer for your application. So Electron Builder will create uh, an MSI for Windows. It'll create a DMG for Mac, which is this kind of the standard, you know, drag this application into your applications folder type interface, and then a uh, Debian package for Linux. Electron Updater is a really nice tool that kind of wraps up the whole update process. Um, this is what, uh, you know, like I said before, you can, you can have your own uh, uh, server API that you can communicate with to see if there's a new update to your, to your application. It'll go and download it. And it does all the hard work of, um, you know, installing the, the files into some temporary space. And when you restart the application, it's going to swap out the old files with the new files and, and restart your application, all that kind of stuff. And then if you're doing... Uh, um, I, my preferred method of, of doing like TDD, BDD style uh, tests for Node has always been a Mocha, and there is a drop-in replacement for, for Mocha called Electron Mocha, and it understands all the additional Electron APIs so that you can put Electron apps under test and, and not, you know, they're going to pass or they're going to run correctly instead of blowing up over, you know, not understanding the Electron stuff. There are a couple of new applications that have been created by GitHub for, to support the development of Electron. One of them is called DevTron. This is what adds uh, the additional tab to your Chrome Dev Tools. And there's, uh, it, it gives you information about assets. It um, monitors IPC communications, so you can track you know, the messages that are being sent between your, your renderers and the main process. Uh, it's even got a linter specifically for Electron built in that'll give you suggestions on, hey, you didn't cover this particular, you know, uh, you, you don't have a, an error handler for your application, you know, it gives you some useful hints about how to create a, uh, an effective Electron app. And then Spectron, I haven't used this yet, but it looks really, really good. It's a testing framework that also allows, it's kind of like WebDriver or Selenium, it also puts your front end uh, API or front end of your application under test as well. Uh, to get started with Electron, I would, I would suggest that you look at a couple of boilerplate projects. One's called Electron Boilerplate. It's already got a whole bunch of gulp 
tasks and everything defined around building your application uh, and some other things around development, it makes it super easy to um, swap out, you know, like the icon images and a few other assets to create a branded version of your application. So it solved a lot of like, you know, some of the process of, of getting an electron application going. And it's, it's completely agnostic. Uh, something I forgot to mention is that, you know, as a, as a developer, you can do whatever kind of front end technology you want to do. If you want to do plain HTML or if you want to use React or Angular, or you know, backbone, or, if you, or just you know, whatever you want to use. Uh, Electron doesn't dictate you know what what kind of front end technology you want to use inside the application. Um, but there is, if you use React, there's a really great boilerplate project called uh, Electron React Boilerplate, and it's got Redux and a bunch of other things already baked in. It's got the hot module code reloading and so forth, so that um, it makes it for a really good development experience with Electron. And there's a brand new one, uh, Paul Betts, one of the guys on the Electron team at GitHub, has created this drop-in replacement for Electron called Electron Prebuilt Compile. And what it does is it has transpilers and some other new useful tools built right into it. So that if you want to use TypeScript or CoffeeScript, or if you want to use React or Less, uh, Jade templates, um, all these things are like native it understands these things right out of the box so that you don't have to have gulp scripts that go and do your these types types of steps. You know, typically you'd have to have some NPM scripts or gulp scripts that are going to transpile, they're going to, you know, turn your less into, you know, CSS or, you know, all these types of steps. Now you can build your Electron app and you can, you know, if TypeScript is your thing, you can do TypeScript all day long and you don't have, you know, it just knows at runtime how to how to deal with the TypeScript. Really awesome. Um, as far as like the, the style of your application, you know, I, you know, I'm a developer, I'm not a designer, I don't know how to create beautiful looking apps, but uh, I think I've had pretty good success just using things like, in this case, this is an application I created using uh, Bootstrap and, and some jQuery. That's, that's all I'm using uh, for this and uh, yeah. You know, those are the glyphs, icons that come with, uh, with Bootstrap. Uh, there's another CSS toolkit called uh, Photon Kit. This is by one of the designers at GitHub, and uh, it makes for a very native looking application. Right now, it only supports, it's the, the UI is only looks like a Mac, um, which is, you know, looks really awesome. So if you run your application on Windows, it just looks like a really beautiful Mac application running on Windows. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so this is an application I created using the Photon Kit, and it, the way it styles the, the windows and the frames and the buttons and everything is very Mac-looking Mac uh, type design. Makes me look good. So uh, some tips uh, so far. Uh, just, little, just little things, really. Um, I, I, maybe if you've noticed, like on the Mac, when you're mount, and, you, you, and you're running Chrome and you put your pointer over a link, it turns into a little cartoon Mickey Mouse hand. Uh, that's typically, you know, not what you expect from a desktop application. So you can turn uh, turn that off just by setting the CSS default cursor uh, on all your elements. Um, another thing, you know, like a little anomaly from Chrome is that. If you click on an image and drag it, you know, you, you get like this ghost image that you can drag around on the screen. Well, you can turn that off. You know, you don't want, uh, you, and you won't be able to, pe people, maybe you want to turn off the, the ability to select text or not, uh, that kind of stuff, drag, drag those things around. One idea is if you do have multiple windows in your application, um, just to be really responsive, you can hook into the close events of those windows if they close it. And instead of actually closing the window, just hide it. Uh, that way, if they want to go back to that window again, you can just instantly show it to them. Uh, you know, it just makes for a more responsive UI. Um, and then I would also suggest that you offload some, you know, if there's work that needs to be done, like Ajax calls or something that might take a long time, offload that to the main process. Use IPC to send a message to main to so go do this thing. And then because that's kind of like how you 
this is kind of like the workaround for multi-threading. Uh, or you could use like web workers or something like that. But the idea is, you know, it's a web app and it's a single threaded event loop. You don't want to block that loop. You know, you want to keep the UI really responsive. So you can, uh, like the Nihilus N1 mail client I was, I was talking about earlier, when, it, when it's doing all the fetching of new emails and checking for mail and, and sending mail, that's all happening on the, you know, separate instance, either on the main thread or on a actually hidden um, instance of, of Chrome to do that work. Common things that, that, that I'm asked about uh, around Electron, uh, local storage, you can read and write, you know, directly to JSON files. This is what I do for like configuration information. It's like a good idea, like a desktop app, when you close it, when you open it back up, you expect it to be in the same spot that you closed it and it's got the same dimensions as when you, you know, last used it. So that's a good idea to store that information. Um, I use FS Jetpack, which makes it just dead simple to read and write JSON files to the file system. Uh, to, to go beyond that, any DB is a, is, it's got kind of like a Mongo DB uh, type API. Pouch DB is like a full Couch DB implementation for local uh, desktop or local systems. The, the advantage of pouch DB is if you're wanting to support a disconnected scenario where you want to keep things synchronized between the, uh, your server and, and the desktop clients, pouch DB can be pointed to a couch DB server and, and automatically keep things in sync when, it's, when it comes back online. Um, if you, you know, really want to access relational database storage uh, from uh, an Electron app, maybe you're building a line of business app inside your organization, you just, you know, you use SQL Server or you use Postgre or something like that and you just want to communicate with that. Well, you have access to the, the entire Node.js ecosystem. So any module that's available for Node, you can use that in your Electron apps. Uh, I recommend on, for SQL Server, uh, a module called Siri8. Uh, it has like a promise-based library. It's got some uh, finite state machine stuff. It's got some really cool features uh, for, for SQL Server. Uh, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle DB, there's, you know, any kind of driver, there's, there's probably a driver for whatever database you want to use uh, for Node. From here, I would say uh, go search for Awesome Electron. This is like the, the exhaustive list of every, anything and everything Electron. Blog posts, videos, tutorials, uh, example applications, um, open source repositories, you know, you can find it all um, at, at this GitHub repository. There is a plural, if you have access to Pluralsight, Rob Connery created a, a Pluralsight course called Electron Playbook. It's not so much a, you know, how to get started with Electron, it's more of like here are some tips of building an Electron app that I, you know, I can share with you from my experience type thing. The uh, documentation for Electron is actually really good. When they released 1.0, they uh, like revamped their entire documentation site and it's, and it's pretty awesome. And then um, for, for asking questions and stuff, the, uh, the Slack community for Atom, there's an Electron channel out there and it's active all the time. And, and a couple of guys from, from GitHub usually hang out in there. There's guys that have, uh, like from Nihilus and those other Electron applications that hang out in there. So you, I have never had any problem at all of asking a question and getting you know, almost an immediate response uh, to anything I, I was uh, running into. Last thing I want to encourage you is that you don't need permission to be awesome. So you're here at this conference to learn new, new things and to take some ideas back to your organization. Uh, they're going to love you, for, you know, for, for the awesome things that you're learning here at this conference. Um, just give it a, you know, experiment. Find time to play with it. Uh, this is, this is really some really exciting technology. I love doing it. And I sincerely believe that we as developers are in such a unique position of, of, of influence on our on our entire world, you know, through technology and through, through the internet. So we, we have just in, incredible power uh, at our fingertips. I think we have quite time for maybe one question. I, nope, we're done. <laughs>